Good evening, everyone, and welcome to week two in CE 155, Facility Layout and Design. Chef Suzanne and I welcome you to another fine live session. Uh, so far, so good. You guys are rocking the house. We're very, very proud of you. Uh, Chef Suzanne and I were speaking earlier today, and uh, there's a lot of really good scores coming through. Uh, and there's a lot of, what really impresses me the most is I think there seems to be a really good attitude of understanding um, about getting things, uh, you know, listening to the evaluations and saying, hey, you're right. You know, maybe I should do it this way. Maybe if I did it, made it a little bit better. And that's the attitude it takes to succeed in this industry. So Chef Suzanne and I are just awfully proud of, of that. You guys rock the house, by the way, uh, getting your assignments in in a reasonable time. We're not doing that for fun. Uh, we're not doing that because we were trying to torture all of you. We're doing that because that's part of being a professional chef. Uh, professional chef, all of you will soon learn that if we can get it done three weeks in advance, we'll have it done four weeks in advance. Uh, you get it done right away because procrastination in this industry is the kiss of death. And so, uh, great habit, great job, everybody, getting your assignments in on time. How did everybody like week one? What kind of feedback do we have? Does anybody want to share their thoughts on week one? Anyone? Don's up there with a funny face. I'm trying to remember week one. Everything has been so convoluted. <laughs> yeah. Week one is where we had to do our station map. Yes. I... I I actually kind of enjoyed it to a point. I mean, I got some good direction from uh, Chef Suzanne. I was a little bit confused in how to do the links and things of that nature, but I mean, that's just minor stuff. But as far as setting it up and understanding the, the actual stations, I look at, you know, we can do this for paper and figure it out, but when we actually go to do a facility and or a truck, the makeup of that, that structure is going to change and it's going to change your thought. And just having the concept of it and saying, oh, this is the idea I want. And I think you'll see in my student writings, it shows a few pictures of some older style type tavern, um, you know, historical stuff to, like that. But that doesn't mean that's exactly what I have to have because I'm not going to get that in some of the facilities that we're going to, whether it's renting, purchasing, or getting the trucks. So I like the diversity and the changes in that. I think it, you know, falls on you, on Chef Suzanne, as far as giving that guidance and saying, like you were saying earlier, look at it this way. And I, I really like that feedback as much as sometimes I don't like feedback because you know, like, oh, what do they know? You know, that sort of thing. But it's true. It's, 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 and I think that's what, uh, I think Samantha had said in there, you need a lot of grace. And you do when you're, you're looking at these things um, and have that open mind that, yes, you have this vision, but it may not be full. So it was, I thought it was a good week. I liked it. Yeah. Good week. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Don. I appreciate that. Bertha, what about you? Um, for me, it was a little difficult trying to find the uh, um, links and stuff. Um, uh -huh. I had a hard time with that because I'm really not computer literate. You know okay. I, mean? I really don't know how to get to places and copy links and paste links to certain areas. So that okay. was my problem. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on um, this afternoon uh, towards the end. And we'll give you a little bit more advice. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask. Uh, we'll, we'll guide you through it. Uh, the first couple of times and the first couple of assignments in this class, especially since they're a little different and we're not using a, a Google folder uh, like you have been, uh, it'll take uh, one or two things to get uh, one or two assignments to get used to it. But after that, it becomes very, very simplistic. You can do it. So uh, you'll make it happen. Thanks for sharing, Bertha. You're welcome. How about Mary Lou? I really enjoyed it and actually it made me kind of really see what equipment was being needed and mm -hmm. I really love uh, Chef Suzanne's feedback because it's like yeah I the simplest thing refrigerator walk-in I was not even thinking of that when I did it until I she, her feedback I was like oh my god everything's gonna spoil but just mm -hmm. looking at it and figuring out oh this is the menu I want and realizing that to produce that menu I need five times the equipment, that was kind of an eye-opener, like, whoa, this is going to be expensive, versus, okay, how can I utilize one item for two or three things on the right. equipment? That, that's what I, it really opened my eyes for me. That's where I was like, whoa. 
That's really, that's really good feedback. And, um, you know, kind of if you look at the bigger picture in this whole exercise is uh, we're going to talk about some numbers later on. And, uh, you know, the average kitchen in the United States, even the littlest kitchens, right around $200,000, $250,000 to, to build, uh, which is a tremendous investment for most people. And, it, you know, should you not take these exercises when it goes to uh, opening up a place, developing a place, or even just purchasing uh, equipment in, uh, for a restaurant that you work at, uh, it can become quite costly. So uh, good job on picking up on all that, Mary Lou. That's fantastic. What about Paul? What's going on, Paul? Um, yeah, I, uh, I struggled a little bit uh, because I don't work in the industry now. And so I'm not quite sure how things get from the grill to the plate to the heat lamp and whatever you call some of those things. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, I did, I did uh, do uh, some research and then I submitted a submission and then uh, Suzanne, uh, Chef Suzanne had some ideas. And so I went back in and made some adjustments. But uh, I feel like I'm like, uh, I'm <laughs> hanging it, on. It's 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 one of those things uh, in industry when you when you're first starting out. Even even after we've been in industry for a long time, we still utilize these tools to help us make good conscientious conscientious and frugal decisions um, about our expenditures. Because the more money we outlay on equipment, the less money we have in our bank for operating capital. And if we don't do it right, if I'm buying equipment I don't need, if I'm buying equipment that's too small, or if I'm buying equipment that I do or, uh, that I do need, but it's the wrong you know way to facilitate it, it those are costly mistakes. And so uh, that, that's a great point that you made, Paul. After a little bit, after a little bit of being in industry, you'll pick up on these things right away, and uh, it, it'll become second nature. So thank you, Paul, for sharing. Samantha, what's going on? So. I don't know why, but I really, really struggled uh, so much so that I procrastinated until Sunday to do it. Okay. Uh, just because I just couldn't wrap my head around what exactly you were asking out of me uh -huh. and what I was supposed to put on paper. Okay. So like, I didn't list all of my equipment because I didn't think it all the way through. Um, mm -hmm. And so... I don't know. It was it was really hard for me, and I don't know why. Because I mean, once I got it done, I was like, I don't I don't think I did it right because it was too easy. Obviously, I didn't look right. It, so I didn't do it right. Um, but it. So I, I, you know, I'm in the process of trying to open up a restaurant, and I have a whole list of equipment that I'm going to need, and I don't know why I didn't just put two and two together. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. And you know what? To be honest with you, Samantha, I struggle in that department too. When I'm looking at an exercise that I don't completely understand, I'll procrastinate until the last minute. But uh, now I've got myself in the habit of uh, I'll just do one. I'll just answer one of those little boxes to get me started, and then it, it'll just build. That's a good idea. Maybe I'll, I might have to do that this week. Yeah, don't, don't tackle the elephant, just break it down into small pieces, and then all of a sudden, the small piece will build into the bigger piece. Awesome, thanks. It'll get easier. Nadine, what's going on? Good evening, Chef. Good evening. Um, I actually uh, think, I actually probably, similar to Paul, and um, I struggled a little bit just because I don't think I quite had, I mean, you know, my plan eventually is to hopefully have my own restaurant in place, but I haven't really, like, taking time to really think about my in concept and everything because I'm still trying to figure out what exactly I want. So it kind of took me some time. So I okay. had to take some time to think about it, but I actually really liked what I came up with, with my uh -huh. menu items and having to think about the different stations and Chef Suzanne gave me back some feedback because I think I listed more of the like, I guess, personnel I would need versus like, I guess, an actual station. So I'm probably going to go back um, or I went back and I'm going to narrow it down to probably more stations because probably realistically, I probably won't have all those specific people. I can probably, you mm -hmm. know, shrink it down to group. But I thought the exercise was like really fun. It really made me think about all that um, I would need and kind of what goes into, you know, mm -hmm. setting up your restaurant from like the menu. So I actually enjoyed the assignment and I actually like sent it to some of my family members. They're like, oh, we would eat there. So um, <laughs> I, I had fun with it uh, towards like the end. But yeah, <laughs> the beginning was a little rough, but I was glad. I So I enjoyed it. Hey, Dean, I think that's awesome that you sent it out to your other family members. The more, the more feedback you guys get on this type of stuff, 
uh, the better it's going to be because there's always going to be somebody that's going to say, hey, you know, maybe it should be turned to the left a little bit. And you know what? They're right. And we can't see everything. So that's absolutely fantastic. And Nadine, and this goes for the rest of you as well, I really encourage you to wait till week six uh, when you get through this course. Your whole thought process is, is, is going to be completely different about opening up a restaurant. Uh, yeah. they, and, and I've mentioned this uh, uh, in other classes as well. One of the biggest challenges that you're going to have in this class is learning to separate what you want from what your business wants. They're two totally different things. And learning how to uh, do what's best for your, be uh, for your restaurant versus what's best for you uh, oftentimes causes a lot of struggle. So over the next six weeks, we're going to be working on that and learning how to do it. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Those are some great comments. Uh, I really appreciate that. Chef Suzanne. Chef Suzanne. Well, I will say, after, after listening to some of the comments just now, if the part you struggled on the most was how to hook up a link, I think you guys are doing just fine. <laughs> like That's literally small potatoes in the, you know, don't even worry about those potatoes. That's how little they are. You, you all did such a nice job on these. I think this one's a little hard because you're really sort of getting your feet wet on what this class is even all about. And for some that, like, like Paul, maybe don't work in the industry on a regular basis, this may have been a little foreign. Uh, so trying to come up with what belonged, what didn't belong, um, and keeping the open mind. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember who was just saying that you may have forgot some equipment that like, I knew that I needed those things. I just didn't think about it. And that's where like chef was just saying, a fresh set of eyes helps. And I may have missed things too, looking at it. But when you get ready to work on your next step where you will work on the layout, you may go, Oh, I did need more refrigeration. I didn't have any listed there. And you'll see that you're, the list that you all have right now, you're going to have a lot more equipment when you start working on your layouts here in another couple of weeks than you even have listed. And you're, here you're probably thinking you didn't even have everything listed. You probably still don't have everything listed. But yeah. that's, that's this whole, that's all of the growth in this, you know, in this class. Uh, so the grades were phenomenal. And uh, if anybody had issues, I sent it back with some feedback and then I would get it right back with adjustments. So um, this has been probably for me, one of the easiest week one assignments for this course to ever grade. So I'm not just saying that you guys really did an amazing job. So uh, if you felt like you struggled, I don't think you struggled as much as you think you did. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Good job, everybody. And you know what that, what that, uh, thank you for those comments, Chef Suzanne. Those are, those are spot on and I agree. And this class is so cool because we're going to take the information that's inside your head and you're going to get it out on paper and then you're going to realize, whoa, in my head it was so awesome, but now that it's on paper, it doesn't, it doesn't work right. And, you know, learning how to make those adjustments is really going to elevate your, your professionalism. We're looking forward to that. Mandy, what's your question or comment? Uh, just a Real quick, um, I really enjoyed last week. That was great. But um, my quick question was, because I've worked in several different kitchens, and I know that there's, like, it, there are as many right ways, quote, unquote, to set up a kitchen as there are people cooking. Uh -huh. um, can we get uh, part of our feedback? Will it be um, as have to do with like the efficiency of our layout or, you know, but if we've got things cr at cross purposes or the cold box next to the fryer, that kind of thing, it, will that be part of our feedback for our layout? This, it, this it, 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 it kind of yeah. Uh, thank you for that comment. That's a good question. And yes, you're going to get a lot of it uh, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, Chef Suzanne will make sure that you're spot on with where you're putting your stuff uh, because we will talk about cross utilization, space, traffic patterns, uh, operational flow, all sorts of different issues in the next coming weeks. So uh, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I can't, I can't explain why this is. I guess I'm just, this just seems to become a natural to me in this course, but I'm the only one that grades this course and have been one of the primary for about a year. So this is my jam. I totally <laughs> love it. So, I, and I will spot those things. I'll be like, okay, you don't have a fryer over here and you need, you know, you've got your dish machine around the corner and behind a wall and you can't even get the storage room. You took out the door 
and I just noticed those things. I enjoy this very much. <laughs> so yeah. I will share everything that I can spot and, and I, I promise I'll give you some great feedback. I promise. Yeah, you guys, are, you. you guys are awfully lucky to be working with Chef Suzanne. Uh, she's she's gonna straighten you out. So Don, what's what's going on? Yeah, I was gonna I was before she uh, Chef Suzanne had said that I was gonna say it's great to have that level of expertise because now that we know that you're the only one doing that, it's like okay, so if we fail, it's your fault, but our error, shared responsibility, right? Now uh, it's good that we to know we're in good hands. But uh, Chef Warren, you had said something that uh, it's a nugget. It, it's the one number one takeaway is it's what you need versus what you want or what you want versus what you need type deal. And that's the biggest thing is understanding that saying I want this, uh -huh. oh, but I, I need this. You know those right. sort of things. So that's like the, the, the one of the key things, one of the nuggets I wanted to mention. I wrote it down, but you stole my thunder. So <laughs> cats out, cats out. But I just want to say. That that's just that's just voice of experience talking. Uh, when I when I say that, and I I, I might have mentioned this before, but my first executive chef position was at a uh, resort in uh, up in the Phoenix area, and I, I remember walking into the kitchen, and the kitchen was three thousand square feet, and it was luxe, and I'm thinking I'm in heaven, uh, but over the ensuing time, it became very challenging to manage that much space. That's one more thing you have to manage. Uh, because you're not uh, in close contact with your culinary staff. You don't have that visual, the cleaning, the maintenance, the amount of equipment that breaks down, the utilities, everything else. And so you really have to think all these things through because all of that comes out of your pocket at the end of the day. And I think most of you know that we work on a fairly narrow profit margin and a lot of restaurants make that mistake in the long run. So uh, great point, Don. Thanks for bringing that up. Ladies and gents, uh, as we move forward, we're not going to be using your facility layout tool this week. Uh, so make sure uh, that you hold on to it. Do not discard it. We'll be back to it in weeks three, four, and five in this class. So uh, we are venturing into a different area this week. Let's take a quick look at our class page. This is a, a walk in the park week here in CE 155. Your research materials, uh, deciding on a food service location, and that's what this week is all about. Uh, thank you very much for attending the live session. Uh, for those of you that aren't here, for those of you that are here as well, uh, this class, it is essential that you attend the live session or watch the live session archive. This is where, where we exchange all of the information. It's very, very important. Um, and then this week, we're working on food business location. And then if you miss anything uh, throughout tonight's live session that Chef Suzanne and I discuss, right down here at the bottom is this week's presentation that you'll be able to refer back to should you need it. So moving forward, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight, uh, some exciting stuff. We're going to uh, just review a couple of simple things from last week real quick before we move too far forward. Please remember, and I just mentioned this about watching the live session. This is posted primarily for those of you that aren't here, but uh, you know, you guys have been awesome and we appreciate all the questions, all the feedback, everything else. It's uh, it, that gets us so excited before you reach out, before you give chef Suzanne and I a call, make sure that you have looked at the, the weekly presentation and also make sure that you've watched the live session archive because generally that's where uh, about 99% of the, uh, uh, questions are going to be answered. So make sure that before you reach or try to contact us that you have gone through that information first. And then um, please be aware that we anticipate, we expect all of your assignments to be turned in by Sunday of each week. This week, there is very little reason not to have all of your assignments turned in by Sunday. Um, it is a professional um, it's a professional action. It's something you're going to have to get used to when you're in industry. And as we've heard multiple times uh, this afternoon, it gives you the opportunity to make changes and get uh, and raise that grade. Isn't that right, Chef Suzanne? It really does. And so many people have took advantage of that by turning those assignments in early that most have already turned it in, got feedback. If they needed to adjust it, they already have. Um, so, I mean, there it's been pretty awesome on my end to see work already done and redone if needed. So it's been yeah. pretty awesome. 
So great job, everybody. And we expect that to happen again Sunday this week. We want to see all assignments turned in. And then this was sent out to uh, everybody. I think there's a lot of students in this class that have some really good time management, uh, which is an essential skill in culinary arts. However, uh, you know, if anybody needs this, this was sent out in your uh, school messaging system. And then it is also here in the weekly presentation. Do your research materials, answer the questions, receive credit on Wednesday of each week as soon as it comes out. Attend and participate the live session Thursday. Complete first draft of assignment on Friday. Review assignment and uh, the rubric before you submit any assignments. Make sure you check the rubric first to make sure that you've answered all of the questions. And then submit assignment Saturday. Boom, you're on easy street. And I forgot to mention one thing here as well. During the live session, let's make sure everybody stays on topic. We have a very uh, large class. And when we start drifting off a topic, especially in the chat room, uh, it kind of slows down uh, everything else. So let's make sure that we all stay on uh, topic. Definitely believe in yourself and be professional in everything you do. And you got this all the way. Thank you, everybody. I see a lot of chef coats out there tonight. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm a, in with a group of my own. Um, my brothers and sisters out there and that is awesome so thank you very much for your professionalism we really appreciate it it really makes a difference in the classroom environment so thank you let's um move on to week two this week we are going to be deciding on a food service location uh it is a major major decision uh, number one, your building is probably going to be one of your most major investments uh, up front or on a monthly basis. Uh, so where do you put that restaurant? Yeah, we just don't throw a dots. There are companies out there such as Olive Garden, Chili's, some of these big box chains that spend upwards of $25,000 doing what we call site surveys. A site survey does traffic counts, demographics, target market, and everything else to determine the best location for them to put their restaurants. Most of us are not in that <clears throat> position where we can pay the $25,000. Uh, so we have to be able to utilize some tools. The tools are following, so pay attention here over the next 45 minutes or so, and we're gonna give you those. <clears throat> and then when it comes to a restaurant, you really need to kind of think uh, about what type of space you need. There are restaurants out there such as Domino's, uh, such as Pizza Hut's that don't need or require prime locations because they do what we call backdoor business, right? A lot of delivery business. So why would they want to pay to be on a street corner? It makes no sense. But then, uh, you know, there are other locations that require high volumes of foot traffic to draw traffic. So those are some of the things that you're going to need to be thinking about. Let's take a look at our first slide. We're right now, we're gonna walk through the steps on deciding your location. Before you decide your location, there's a couple of things that you need to do. Step one, this is, this is actually quite simple. So step one, you need to fully develop your concept. You need to ask yourself, who am I? What do I do? And what am I serving? right? You need to be able to put yourself into one of these categories right up here. Okay. Very, very important. Am I a fast, casual restaurant? Do you want people to walk in, grab that chicken sandwich and get out? Right? Are you a family style bistro? Right? Are you a family style restaurant? Are you fine dining? Are you cafe bistro? Uh, Don, I didn't put German deli up here. I, I'm sorry. But um, uh, are you food truck, restaurant buffet? Quantify yourself as to what type of facility you are. Then you're going uh, to uh, determine who you are going to sell this food to. This is what we call our target market. Target market is the single most important thing in deciding your restaurant location. Your target market is who your customer is going to be. We never ever want to abstain from serving anybody, right? We, we open our doors, we take care of everyone. However, we generally have a specific target market that we go for. For example, 
a fine dining restaurant is going to appeal to somebody who has um, a little bit more disposable income, right? Generally, somebody who's a little bit more well-traveled, generally somebody who's a little bit more educated because they have an educated palate, they've been exposed to different things. You know, that group could be considered professionals. Right? So, hey, that tells me a lot about how much I can charge for my food, what should I be serving, what should my dining room look like, Right? and where I should put my location. Does that make sense to everybody? Alexandria, did you have a quick question? I just had a question about, you said the, um, the assignment is going on Sunday. Um, so what, what's the difference of how it being done? Because you should be, what, uh, Tuesday midnight? So how, like Tuesday midnight uh, is the... Uh, the, uh, that is when the actual assignment becomes late. Okay. So. Right. We understand if there are sometimes strenuating circumstances where you can't turn it in till Monday or Tuesday, but we're trying to get this class as a whole and we expect that everyone will be able to do it and have their assignments in by Sunday. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Alexandria, for asking that. Let's go back to our chart here. Some of the some of the, the, the different groups, uh, empty nesters, right? Uh, empty nesters are people that no longer have anyone at home. They're generally retirees. There are certain groups of uh, retirees that you can appeal to. Some are on a limited income. Uh, some have large amounts of disposable income. So you need to zero in on that for your target market. Families with children, right? So if your target market is families with children, you're going to need to put that in a family-friendly area of your town, right? You're not going to put it next to, uh, you know, Mr. Joe's show club because uh, you don't want to be walking, you know, in, in that type of area. So, um, you know, you, you have to think that through. Single millennials, right? Millennials are, are uh, one of the biggest uh, target markets that are out there. A lot of people will consider target markets generations, right? We have Generation X, we have baby boomers, we have millennials. Millennials today are uh, traditionally uh, educated professionals, single, traveled, uh, great palate, willing to spend a little bit more on money. So maybe that's who you want to go after. Maybe that's your group. Don, what's your question? Yes, I was going to say that, um, you know, for a fixed facility, I understand that uh, concept. When it comes to actual gut trucks and moving them around, you're going to hit a, a multitude of different uh, areas of what you're talking about, you know, as far as your target market, uh, market audience is concerned. So I think don't focus just on one piece of that, one aspect of it. You got to focus on a big span because you got to follow the money. So right. um, would that be true in, in this case? I mean, with the gut no. truck and stuff? Uh, a, a food truck, um, a food truck, the way I look at it, yeah, you, you and we're going to talk about food trucks here a little bit later on. Um, but when it comes to food trucks, uh, you, you're going to have uh, a group that will buy your food. Uh, you're going to attend events. For example, uh, we have a church uh, up the street that has food trucks that come once a month. Those food trucks are very specific trucks because the people that attend that church are, have a very high income, very high level of disposable income, and they all have families, right? So that attracts a certain type of food truck. Uh, to the group. It's, it's, it's not the, the Philly cheesesteak, uh, uh, cheeseburger type crowd. It's, it's more the, we have a, a Peruvian food truck that comes on a regular basis. It's things like that. And when you do have a food truck, you're going to have a very specific target market. Hey, uh, do I like to hit up the uh, sporting events, right? Do I do the, go to the baseball field, right? Or I have a little bit more of a conservative concept with my food truck, uh, maybe the church groups, that type of thing. So yeah, in a sense, it does apply. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say 110 percent because I think a food truck needs all the money it can get. So uh, you know, you're not going to really exclude anybody uh, at that point. So moving on, everybody. So once you uh, understand your your target market. That's really going to help you understand the foods and the beverages that you are going to serve, right? Once you understand who you are serving to, 
then you can really get a good solid uh, vision of what your menu should be like, okay? Does that make sense? For example, if you were gonna be doing a German deli, right? And your target market was, um, was, was people that had specifically traveled there, uh, people that had been to various regions throughout Germany, which has some incredible foods, uh, and you were able to identify that as being your target market, you would know that you'd have a little bit more disposable income. You could probably charge a higher price Instead of buying veal, frozen veal cutlets, you could actually uh, buy fresh veal cutlets uh, and things like that. It all comes into play, especially if you know that you have your target market uh, that can afford to buy those types of things. So very, very important. Once you understand your uh, menu, your restaurant style, and your target market, then you can create your pricing structure. Right? Your pricing structure is then going to tell you what you can afford to pay for rent, okay? Once you have uh, developed your pricing structure, you're going to figure out the amount of covers per day, right? A cover is a customer. A turn is every time somebody sits in the seat, eats, pays, and leaves. Does everybody understand that? A turn is a customer that comes in, eats, and pays, and leaves. That is a turn, okay? So you're going to uh, estimate the amount of covers that you are going to serve per day. Be realistic with your estimation, okay? We all wanna do 10,000 covers per day. You know, we all wanna feed 10,000 people at 50 bucks a pop but we know that's not always reasonable. So based on your concept, if you're doing a sit down, uh, mon pa type cafe, um, that's gonna be on the smaller side, you could probably estimate that you're gonna do about 100 covers per day or 100 tur or uh, I'll explain the turn thing here in just a moment, but 100 covers per day, 100 customers. So once you've estimated the amount of covers, that you will be doing on a daily basis, you will then be able to estimate your revenues, okay? When it comes to estimating your revenues, you've got a clear vision of your menu. You should be able to apply prices at this point to that menu, okay? And you should be able to figure out what the average person approximately is going to spend on food. Does that make sense to everybody? So based on your menu, you will understand that you will be able to feed, that each customer in this instance uh, would spend approximately $25 per person on food. That's just a number out of the air. Your, your number will be a little bit more accurate based on your concept. If it's a small ma and pa place, maybe you're planning on $12. Uh, maybe if it's a, a fine dining restaurant, you're planning on 50. However, if you plan on having 100 seats in your restaurant and turning each seat two times per day, you are estimating that you will serve 200 people per day. If your average menu price is $25, you'll multiply 200 times 25, and that equals $5,000 per day in revenues. Your monthly rent should equal no more than 10% of your gross revenues. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you're estimating that your restaurant is going to generate $100,000 a month in rent, or $100,000 a month in gross revenues, your rent should be no more than $10,000 per month, okay? So in the restaurant industry, we, we figure 10% uh, is our number. I think at home for our personal lives, we want our, our mortgages or our rent to be right around 25%. However, in the restaurant industry, we plan on doing right around uh, 10%. Does everybody understand that so far? So now, now that we've figured out how much money we can spend on rent, now we can start zeroing in on where we can rent, okay? At this point, we understand our target market. 
we understand um, our revenues, we understand our concept, and now we can start moving in a little bit better. So going back to our slides, um, this, is the real, this is the real tricky part. This is where things become interesting in this. And a lot of this is very theoretical. Uh, there is no exact way to do this. Now, what type of location are you going to choose? That's a really hard thing to do. A lot of people like to go in, and I did this once. Uh, one of my restaurants was in, a, in the location of a failed restaurant. Uh, we chose that restaurant, my partner and I, because of the fact our conversion cost would be very, very low. Because we wouldn't have to go in there and do a complete remodel, just a partial remodel. So we were able to save quite a bit of money. And guess what? There was a reason that restaurant that was there before failed. And a lot of times you run into this uh, in industry where, where one restaurant will close down and they'll open up another one in the same exact location. And six months later, that one is closed down. They call those cursed locations. So be very conscientious of that when it comes to taking a look um, at a facility. Now, when it comes to uh, a lot of us end up leasing restaurants. Leasing restaurants can be a very, very tricky uh, thing. Number one, leases are negotiable, regardless of what they tell you, right? So if you walk in and they say, we want $13 per square foot on the lease, you can counter offer that. It's just like buying a house. Do not take what they offer you. Number two, what most people overlook is most landlords are willing to amortize that rent over a period of time. One of my restaurant facilities, I went in and I said, hey, uh, I, I can only give you a thousand bucks a month for the six, first six months. And then after that, I'll, I'll increase my rent by $500 per month until I get to the full $6,000 per month. The landlord said, great, fantastic, right? But if I wouldn't have asked for it, I wouldn't have gotten it. So you can remember, hey, that landlord is just as interested in you succeeding as you are, because if you succeed, then the landlord uh, succeeds. And so that's, that's very, very important to take and remember. Uh, to remember. Most restaurant leases come in the form of uh, five and 10 year uh, periods. Once you are in a lease, you are in the lease. Does everybody understand that? There is none of this, uh, hey, I ain't making it, I, I need to cancel this arrangement. Uh, they don't do that. It does not work that way. So uh, those are some of the things that you really need to take into consideration when it comes to leasing out of place. There are things such as triple net leases uh, that you can get approached with. Triple net leases means that you are responsible for maintaining the entire facility, such as HVAC, drains, everything else. Uh, those leases are generally a little bit less expensive, but they can be boom, they can be very troublesome as well. A lot of landlords also will do what we call tenant improvements, meaning they will help you build your space out uh, if you ask them. Okay, Does that make sense to everybody? A lot of these things I'm telling you are uh, landlords do not offer these things. If you go in and you ask them, then they will do it. Everybody has this mentality that, okay, the place is $5,000 a month. Let's work that into our budget. You don't have to pay the $5,000 a month if you don't want to. So you can negotiate and change that. So once you have all of those factors in your mind, there's some very serious questions that you need to begin asking yourself. Okay? Does, my, does the target market live or congregate in the chosen area? And what that means is if you are, uh, your, your lunch business is primarily, your primary target market is business professionals and you're planning on serving lunch and catering in the downtown area, okay, good. You should open up in the downtown area because your target market congregates in that area, right? Okay, my target market is empty nesters. Okay? Am I going to open up in the downtown area? It wouldn't make any sense, would it? Okay. Also, think about this. Um, downtown areas are generally businesses that are Monday through Friday. 
Am I going to open up a fine dining restaurant that does most of its business at nighttime on a Saturday night? It's not a wise move. I'd probably be a little bit more out in the, in the suburb areas where a lot of those people live. Uh, that would uh, make a little bit more sense. So think about where your target market goes. It's very, very important. That also applies to the food trucks, right? My target market is, um, you know, they, they, my, the empty nesters, the senior citizens love my food. I do beef stroganoff and I do some of these other dishes that are retro, right? Where do those people go, right? You're gonna go where your target market goes. Is there enough foot traffic or vehicular traffic in the area that I want to put my restaurant? Okay. What that means is some concepts will rely, fast casual concepts rely heavily upon traffic. Um, if you need to have a lot of traffic, maybe you wanna consider an area with a captive audience. An area with a captive audience would include a mall, an airport, an area like that. Um, or you need a high visibility location that's going to cost you a lot more money. And one of the biggest things that I've always forgotten to check. What are the other businesses in the area? Check it out. Take some time to think about this one, okay? You may find, you may have this dream of going into this old warehouse, this red brick building that I can convert and make into the most incredible bistro in the world, you know, and I did this. I opened up a restaurant in downtown Phoenix, Arizona that I thought was the ideal location right? But I forgot to check the homeless population down there, right? And it, it, it just, it's, it's, it's an issue in our society and these people need help. Unfortunately, it's set a stigmatism towards the facility, right? And we are running a business and we are trying to generate profit. We need to be very conscientious about what's going on in our area. So you need to check that out. Very, very important. Are there, event, uh, are there event venues in the area that cause unusual flows of traffic? Okay. Are there things that occur in your chosen location that are gonna prevent your customers from being able to access your facility? Okay. If you are near a concert venue, a comedy club that has a high volume of traffic and your primary target market is families with children, right? Are they gonna be able to get their strollers across the street and everything else um, if you're next to a stadium, right? That's something you need to be very conscientious of. A lot of people think going next to a stadium, man, I'm gonna make a killing. There's 70,000 people that show up to this game. Wait, you know, <laughs> think it through. You're only gonna get about 2% of those people to eat at your place on a monthly basis when they do attend the game. So what about the other 28 days a month, yeah? Mary Lou, what's your question? Really quick, um, my question is in regards to like trending facilities. For example, I know where I'm looking at. Right now, the semi-cargo boxes, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what it's called. That's what's really trendy there, and that's really caught my eye because if you're able to stack them and just the layout, I think would work. Um, is that something to consider because it's being trendy or something that is functionable? Uh, that, that's a really intelligent question. I've seen those storage container uh, mm -hmm. facilities uh, pop up uh, in a lot of different areas and a lot of different uh, ways. I think it's a very trendy thing. Um, I don't know how long that trend will last uh, into the future. However, I think economically, it's a very wise choice. It's a, I think it could become a very good starting point uh, for you if you plan on building and growing. And it might be a good place for you to get your feet wet. They are innovative. They appeal to a certain target market, especially the millennials, because they're mm -hmm. cycling. And, you know, so if that ties in with your target market, you know, I know uh, Starbucks just built an 11,000 square foot facility out of storage containers in Taiwan. So well, the, the reason I was asking is because um, I know there's like a huge, just like food truck vendors. Um, that's how this area is, and that's all it started just being just these containers, and I've seen it really expand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to go into that direct area where there's so much, but I'm seeing them more and more pop up, 
And that's what it's like. If you really look at it space wise, they're not very big. Obviously, you're bringing down your numbers as far as customers go as sit down. But I'm like, would it phase out? But then again, food trucks, they've been around for so long. Right. So that's something I've been bouncing back and forth with. Right. It's that that's you need to do a lot of research on that with the food trucks. Uh, you know, I think I've mentioned this before, and I, I think it's in the next class we get into this. Um, you know, food trucks have an 80% failure rate within the first five years. It's a very risky business. Food trucks really became very prevalent. Uh, they started to get popular about six, seven years ago. Uh, we've seen the crest and now we're on the downhill side of that. Uh, and I think a lot of people got into those food trucks with these aspirations of generating millions of dollars in revenue. And then they realized that uh, it's a lot of work and it's not that easy. So it, it's kind of like the breweries. A lot of breweries have popped up. Um, trend, uh, people thought they could get into the brewing business. That was a lot more simple. And now they're realizing it's more difficult. And uh, So those are really good questions that you asked, uh, Mary Lou. Uh, you've got some serious thinking to do. And uh, my, my word of advice would be to make sure that number one, it fits your concept. Uh, and number two, it's an economically wise decision. Okay. Mandy, what's up, Mandy? Yes, I, I had a quick question. Uh, you were talking about um, leases and negotiating and things like that. And uh, I wanted to know if, is there a, obviously a real estate agent might be able to help you, but is there some manner of professional out there in the world that focuses on uh, leasing not just commercial spaces, but restaurant spaces. Is there Absolutely, a yeah. that creature or do they exist? They're, 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 they're referred to as brokers. Uh, and then you could, you could just uh, Google restaurant brokers in your area. Uh, I, I, it, and I'm not so sure I'm really into that uh, kind of thing. And I'll share one experience with you. I, I was doing uh, one restaurant and I, you know, met the landlord, checked out the space, you know, our broker brought us there. Uh, opened up the door for us, and then we talked with the landlord and kind of worked everything out. And, uh, you know, then we sit down to sign the lease, and the broker's there, and you know, and and you know, he gets a check for fifteen thousand dollars for, uh, you know, brokering this property, and that's because that's their standard commission. So, do you need one? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sold on it that you do. Uh, I I wondered because uh, I had. I don't really, unless I completely scrap the food truck idea, um, I don't need a brick and mortar location. Mm -hmm. But what I might need is um, like a kitchen in addition to my food truck. I'm, it's it's on the list for research and I haven't, I haven't looked at it yet, but I, um, I wondered if there was someone out there that is, it, you know, I can do the legwork, mm -hmm. but uh, if there was somebody that's, that, I was afraid there might be some disreputable people and that kind of thing. So, but yeah, I'll do the legwork. I just, I didn't know if there was something easier. <laughs> Google. Yeah. Google. <laughs> Google. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Andy. I appreciate that. Let's move on. And uh, this uh, other issue that we need to talk about is called demographics. Uh, what are the demographics in the area? That is a really, really important question to ask yourselves. Um, you know, are you going to be a good fit for the neighborhood? Is the neighborhood going to be a good fit for you? Uh, for example, if you decide that uh, part of your concept is alcohol sales, right? Uh, there are a lot of restrictions in the United States that are imposed by states about where you can put those facilities, right? You know, like in the state of Arizona, you cannot open up a restaurant across the street from a school if you plan on serving alcohol, right? There's a lot of restrictions. In that neighborhood um, that you plan on opening up in, uh, you know, Mary Lou was talking about the storage container. Should that storage container area, uh, which has a lot of appeal to millennials, is it in an industrial area where there's a lot of engineer, uh, blue collar type workers, uh, you know, welding and that type of stuff that don't fit into that target market. I mean, that theoretically, you know, uh, and they don't fit into that target market. Does that make sense for you to put your restaurant there? You know, so these, these are the questions that you need to ask yourselves. 
these questions are going to give you the answers to this week's assignment. And then um, moving on to this week's assignment, uh, it is you're going to you're going to do this in a Google Doc um, and submit the link uh, to the doc in the ad submission area. And you are going to ask where do you intend or you're going to explain where do you intend to start your food business be specific we don't need the actual address do we chef suzanne no but uh using sentences talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that location at least two advantages and two disadvantages all of the questions that you have to ask yourself that are in this weekly presentation are going to give you the advantages and disadvantages. Does everybody understand that? So you need to remember to write in a professional manner. Use proper language, use uh, proper grammar. I will tell you one thing, the way you write and the way you communicate, that's what portrays your professionalism. And not all of us are the best writers and we all need to practice. I need to practice as well and I do on a regular basis. So start getting yourselves in the habit of writing correctly, right? Use proper sentence structure, use periods, use commas, use all these other types of good things. Because once you get into industry, this is going to be your image. So it's very, very important. Um, and then don't forget to add a brief one to two sentence summary of your concept. Chef Suzanne, do you want to explain this next slide? Absolutely. This is basically what you're looking at. Uh, this is what this week's assignment is going to look like. Uh, so if I had already decided on my concept, here basically is, I would say, that I'm looking at the southwest section of the downtown area uh, in Happyville, where I happen to live in Happyville. And you have to choose two advantages and two disadvantages. And there's probably going to be lots, right? You know, there's probably going to be lots of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so here in Happyville, one of the advantages is that there's a lot of my target market nearby, which means that that's going to help my sales and profit because there's a lot of my target market. Uh, another advantage is that the rent prices in Northwest Happyville downtown are a lot better than in the Southern downtown area. So that's, those are two advantages of that location that I'm choosing. All right. So then you also have to do the disadvantages. So again, you've got high volume of traffic, which makes it harder for my customers, my potential customers and target market to find a place to park. They can't find a place to park. Then I'm not going to get any business. The second disadvantage of the location I'm looking at uh, would be that maybe there's a lot of business professionals, so there isn't very much weekend traffic, so the sales will be down. Uh, and I could probably list, you know, 50 advantages and 50 disadvantages of Northwest downtown Happyville. But you just need to list two. Two advantages, two disadvantages. Don't just tell me that um, the, uh, for, for example, don't just put down that the volume of traffic would be lower on the weekends. What, why would that be the, a problem? Why would that be a disadvantage? You just need to elaborate and put, because that would affect sales and they would be lower. Mm -hmm. And then uh, here is uh, some um, additional information some, from some very common questions that have popped up over time. Uh, and Chef Suzanne put this particular slide together. You want to explain it, Chef Suzanne? I can, absolutely. Uh, because I have seen a lot of these assignments, I see a lot of the same questions. Uh, so probably the, the, the easiest one is if you're making a, a restaurant, fine dining, casual dining, a bakery, a buffet, a bistro, a coffee shop, uh, an actual brick and mortar, this is going to be based on the location that you want. Pretty straightforward. Where it gets a little different is, I think probably the most difficult this week is going to be typically for food trucks, trailers, concession stands, because you're mobile. So you can set up in a huge amount of different places. For this assignment, you need one. 
You just need to choose the one location that you think will be your primary location. So if you think that you're going to set up in southwestern, northwestern, Happyville downtown, that would be the location. Yes, you could go downtown. You could also be by the college. You could go to the fair. But you're just going to choose your one primary location where you will be doing most of your selling from. Um, someone actually just asked about this in the chat box a second ago. Uh, in a lot of places, you have to have a separate kitchen for a food truck. Uh, and in the case of a lot of food trucks, you can't prepare everything there, in which case a lot of food truck folks have a commercial kitchen or a commissary, like a rental kitchen that they use. So if you're going to have a big fancy, what we're talking about, chef, a Peruvian restaurant, you're gonna uh -huh. have this big elaborate food truck, you're probably not gonna do all of your cooking on your food truck. You're probably going to have a commercial kitchen somewhere that you own or that you rent or that uh, you work out of. And so you're gonna have to tell about both of those locations, where your primary location is gonna be for your truck, and then also, what about your location for your brick and mortar that you'll actually just cook out of? Um, now, some people will just cook on their food truck. You know, if you're just, uh, if you're doing corn dogs and funnel cake and fair food and things, that's awesome. You're probably just going to do everything right there. Um, caterers, you need to put down the location of your commercial kitchen that you will be working out of. The same thing if you're going to have, if you're going to be a private chef or a personal chef. Um, if you're going to do the meal prep, some, I know somebody was talking about like the ghost kitchens where you may only be delivery or online ordering. This needs to be based on the location where you're actually going to have your physical brick and mortar building. Uh, because theoretically, everyone should have, you know, unless you're in a dedicated food truck where you can do everything, pretty much everyone is going to have a brick and mortar building. Um, this is just kind of as generic. Everybody needs to do a kitchen it should not be something based out of your home. There is very, very little that you can make out of your home uh, other than the handful of folks that are just going to do exclusive cottage food. So if you are doing exclusive uh, cottage law foods, contact Chef Rye and we'll direct you, but that's the minority. Very, very few people will do that. And, so well, that's excellent information. And I can tell you Chef Suzanne is going to look upon this as though she was a bank and banks need to understand clearly. You cannot, uh, if you're a catering operation and you're putting yourself on the far east side and your clientele is on the far west side, the bank is gonna wanna know why, right? How are you gonna justify that? What are the advantages of you doing that? So this week's uh, assignment I think is, is fairly straightforward. It's uh, fairly simple. Let's answer uh, Mandy's question real quick. Mandy, what's up? Hi, most of, uh, Su Chef Suzanne answered 99.5% of what my <laughs> question was. I just want to clarify one As thing. As usual, yeah. <laughs> she read my mind. Anybody uh, from Happyville can answer those questions. So. Of course. I'm going to have um, for the purposes of the assignment anyway, I'm going to have a base kitchen, a commercial kitchen, and a food truck. So I need to list two, two advantages and two disadvantages for each location. That's a, that, that's a funny question. I, I'm, I'm going to say that I want to know that you're going to have a commercial kitchen, but I really want to know the disadvantages and advantages of where you're actually going to be selling from, if that makes sense. I think where you're actually selling from is really the nitty gritty with a food truck or a food trailer. But I also want to know that you're going to have another kitchen, right? So if you're just doing like the carnival food, not I don't want to say just, I keep saying just, I don't mean just because carnival food is amazing. But if you are doing carnival food, you're not going to need that commercial kitchen. And so it's not gonna matter a whole lot moving forward in the in this course. Um, it really matters more. So for you, you can just put in there somewhere that you've got that second location that you will have that base location, commercial kitchen, commissary kitchen, uh, but your advantages and disadvantages need to be about your food truck location. So okay. That's a really good question. That is a really good question. I'll focus on those and I'll, I'll be thinking because I have the location here, but I really need to be thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of that as well. So I'll, I'll just file it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mandy. That was a great answer, Chef Suzanne. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? 
Matthew, what's up? Uh, the only question I really have is uh, I have a, a garage out back that I could build a perfect kitchen. It's huge. I have nothing in it right now. If I decided to use it as a commercial kitchen and only use it for a food truck, could I list that bid? Uh, highly unlikely because of zoning restrictions. Uh, that, so that's probably not going to happen. That, that, that would be my gut instinct. I mean, you could check with your local zoning regulations and uh, that type of stuff, but generally that, that doesn't work that way. So uh, because restaurants have a tendency to attract a lot of very special things into the area uh, from, from pests and, and other types of stuff. And so uh, that's one of the primary reasons they don't want them in a residential area. Uh, so most likely uh, that would not come to fruition and I wouldn't want to encourage you to go down that path uh, if it's not going to be realistic. So, um, so if the state law actually says that I can have a commercial kitchen as long as I do no family cooking within that kitchen at my house, then I could do it. That, if, you're, if the law allows it, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But uh, for the purpose of this exercise, we, we'd like to find out uh, uh, you know, where you would choose to put your food service location. Um, and so we, we'd rather you avoid using your home uh, at this point and uh, look for a commercial location just to go through the exercise of understanding how to properly do it. That makes sense, Matthew? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Welcome. Any other questions? Ladies and gents, let's get them in by Sunday this week. You can do it. So uh, you guys did awesome last week. I think this is highly feasible uh, to have everything on the table by Sunday. Let's be professional. Let's get ahead of the curve like chefs do in industry. Start the habit now. If anybody has any questions, make sure you watch the live session archive and read the weekly uh uh, presentation. If you still have questions, Chef Suzanne and I are here at your service. I hope everybody has a great day today. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.